In this video, we'll introduce a very simple technique to build real-time embedded systems, the Cooperative Scheduler. This approach has some limitations, but it is useful in simple systems. Our first scheduling algorithm is known either as cyclostatic or TDMA. TDMA stands for Time Division Multiple Access. You may have heard this term in either communications or networking, but we also use it in real-time systems. TDMA uses time slots to build the schedule. Each process has its own time slot, and the algorithm walks through the time slots in the same order every period. So here's our period. We first execute task 1, then task 2, then task 3. Next period, the same thing, T1, T2, T3. So this is a very simple scheduling algorithm that can be implemented in a very small amount of code. It can even be built in hardware. That also means that it takes a very small amount of time to execute. Utilization is easy to calculate because it's the same every period. However, it's not as good for unexpected loads such as sporadic tasks. If we want to handle sporadic tasks, we have to pre-allocate a time slot. When we have a sporadic task, we execute it in that time slot. But if we don't have a sporadic task, we've wasted the time slot. Our next scheduling algorithm is only slightly more complicated. Round Robin also uses time slots, but it only schedules the process in that time slot when it has something to do. So in this period, we execute T1, T2, T3. But in the next period, T1 doesn't have anything to do. So we execute T2, T3, and then we have an empty time slot at the end. An alternative would be to leave the empty time slot where it was. In this case, it would be at the beginning of the period. This approach has the advantage of being a little better at handling sporadic tasks because we occasionally can have empty time slots. We can put the sporadic task into that empty time slot. Now we can start to think about how to program our cooperative scheduler. Let's start with an extremely simple way to build a program that repeatedly executes tasks. We'll use a while true loop. The while true loop will be executed over and over again. Here's our first task. Here's our second task. So now the while true loop executes each task and then it starts over and it executes each task again. We can build a UML sequence diagram to understand its operation. The while true loop starts, it calls P1, which returns. The loop then calls P2, which returns again. Now the loop starts over. It executes P1, which returns P2. But what happens if we change our code so that one of our routines runs longer than it used to? In this case, we've changed P1 so that it takes longer to execute. Now the while true loop starts and it calls P1. P1 takes longer because we changed the code. So now it returns later. That means that the iteration for P2 starts later. When it returns, the entire loop has taken longer. So now the next loop iteration will start later. And once again, P1 will execute longer, which means we delay P2 again, and the loop keeps getting delayed more and more. We can get around the limitations of the while true loop by introducing a timer. A timer allows us to control when we start to execute our set of tasks. It still doesn't give us detailed control over the timing of individual tasks. We'll use this C function P all to represent the handler that is called when the timer interrupts. It calls the two tasks, P1 and P2. Now every time the timer interrupts, this will be called and will execute the two tasks, but they won't execute it again until the next timer interrupt. Here's our sequence diagram to describe this. The timer interrupts. It calls our handler, which first calls P1 and then P2. Now at the next timer interrupt, P all is called again, which calls P1 and then P2 and the process repeats periodically because it's controlled by the timer. If not all our tasks run at the same rate, 
we may be able to use a counter to handle very simple <clears throat> If not all of our tasks run at the same rate, we may be able to use a counter to handle simple multi-rate processing. So here we've introduced a counter P2 count that's incremented by our interrupt handler. So when we execute, we first do P1, we then test the counter. If the counter is at least two, we execute P2 and we reset the counter. Then we execute P3. So P2 is not executed on every timer interrupt. Clearly, this only works for simple multiples of periods. Another way to handle multiple rates would be to have multiple timers. So here we have two handlers, A and B. Each is designed for a different rate. Each calls the tasks that run at that rate. Of course, this approach is limited by the number of timers we have in our system. We can use this technique to build simple real-time embedded systems. Here's code for a PIC-16. The timer handler is called every time timer 0 interrupts. It sets a timer flag. The main loop watches the timer flag, and when it's set, it executes three tasks and then resets the flag. At the next timer interrupt, the flag is set again. So this allows us to execute a small number of tasks with regular timing. To summarize, we introduced two simple scheduling algorithms, TDMA and round robin. We saw how to use C functions as tasks in our cooperative scheduler. The while true loop allowed us to cyclically execute those tasks, but it gave us no control over timing. So we introduced a timer in order to build simple, real-time embedded systems.